Reason2 is a classic example of managing your expectations. If you want it to be anything like its predecessor, you might end up sorely disappointed. Many years have passed since the events of Reason1 and time has not been kind to the nameless protagonist. That's another way of saying that things have changed. It's time for a new kind of adventure, so please forget everything you know, just like the hero has. Gone is the time of the classic fantasy formula from Gothic 1, 2 and Risen. Nigh is the time of Grog and Rum, the time to raise your anchors, set sail on the southern seas to look for booty and adventures. Unlike the story in Risen, which was dark in the face of impending doom for the people on the island of Faranga, the story in Risen 2 is very light-hearted and humorous and it doesn't take itself seriously for one bit. You are to become a pirate and embrace everything this new life has to offer. Risen 2 is an RPG developed by Piranha Bytes and published by Deep Silver back in 2012, almost three years after its predecessor. The story follows the events started on the island of Faranga, with titans now raging wars across the lands, with what's left of humanity trying to stop them. The game feels and plays differently in its entirety, with only some of the characters from Risen to remind you that this is in fact a sequel. I like that Risen 2 went in a different direction from the classic formula of Risen. I welcome the prospect of playing something fresh. But while I did love some of the humor in this game and a few other aspects, I felt like too much was sacrificed in regards to the story, gameplay and characters in order to achieve it. The game felt almost single-minded in its pursuit of telling jokes, so much so that many of them fell flat especially in a situation where it was supposed to be an important or serious moment. Before we continue, I must warn you that this review will contain spoilers, so if you haven't played the game yet or care about spoilers, thank you for your time, but please, don't watch any further. I will also be comparing it with some of the other Piranha Bytes games, because I think it's important to have a perspective of how things used to be and how they've changed. And while I'm the type of person who welcomes change when it's good and improves things, I also don't appreciate change just for the sake of change. All this being said, I believe that while Risen 2 can be a fun, light-hearted and humorous experience, it is ultimately a flawed RPG that doesn't meet the standards raised by its predecessors, both the Gothic series or Risen, and in this review I'll present to you why. I propose that we start by talking about the things that I did enjoy about the game first, because otherwise they will get buried in the relatively longer list of things that I'll be criticizing it for. First of all, Risen 2 offers something unique and apart from its peers, which I would also argue to be its main selling points, and that is charm and humor. I found myself having some fun during my let's play either because of the dialogue I was having with one of the companions or the silly situations we kept finding ourselves in. For a story about pirates, I thought the dialogue, the characters and the adventures we had were for the most part spot on. Drinking rum, trash talking and looking for treasures were all part of the deal and the game didn't disappoint. I thought the pirate characters were very well voice acted and it was funny to see them go at each other with their trashy cussing. I only crawled out of your wanking pit, you pig shagging landlubber. Only to see if the stories were true about you being sober, you rum sodden old git. I'm wanting two crates and I won't give you more than seven for them, got it? So you're here to rob me then? Five for four. It's you robbing me more like eight for three. Eight for three? Piss off! Seven for three! Pox ridden old whorehounds! Cabin boy fancy in bio bag! Agreed! Seven for three it is! <laughs> I especially like the Shaganubi natives, they were my favorite. 
their language and customs were not only hilarious, but also interesting. Can I help you? We must gather up the offerings. Kanadiktu. Kanadiktu Kanad what? <laughs> Shaganumbi? I suppose. <laughs> no, no. Offerings to Kanadiktu from the people of the village. More stuff to deliver to Crow, you mean? You do not know Kanadiktu, do you? Uh, no. Then I will show you. Okay. But only once you have gathered up the offerings. Of course. My only regret is not having more creative quests to do for them or even their own storyline that I could pursue to learn more about them as a tribe. The companions you could recruit to join you in your adventures pretty much carried this game for me in terms of fun. I'm of the opinion that exploring the world is much more fun when you have a comrade by your side to share the burdens. Freddy was my trusted skeletal companion in Risen, but unfortunately he didn't say much at all. He was a um, very private type of summon. The good news is that in Risen 2, all the companions have their own unique personalities and will be more than happy to share their thoughts with you. Amongst them, the one that stood out the most and my favorite by far was Patty. About that kitchen thing. Over my dead body, or yours? Uh, preferably neither one of us. I have this plan. Uh-huh. We need provisions. Yes, so? And you're in the kitchen. No, I'm not. I mean, if you were in the kitchen. What? Then you could pocket a few more rations, maybe even a couple of bottles of rum. No one will notice. So I work against my will. Yes. And you get the money. No, we get the money, right? We're in this together, Patty. Um, no. You thought, there's a woman, she must be my slave. No. No, that's exactly what I was not thinking. No. Lying bastard. Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. But remember, I'll get knives in this job. I guess I'll have to watch my back. Thank you, Patty. Patty was the heart and soul of this game. It wouldn't even be difficult to argue that she's the actual main protagonist, with the nameless hero being her supporting sidekick. She's the one that sets in motion the main events of the game to defeat the Kraken and to find her father's treasure, a quest which was started back in Risen. It was good to see how much she has grown from her time being a tavern keeper on Faranga. Patty was an absolute joy to bring along on my adventures. She was a fierce, headstrong and a reliable badass who wanted to prove herself and wouldn't take crap from anybody, least of all men. In fact, for the better part of the game, Patty was a stronger fighter than I was and I found myself constantly relying on her support. To top it all off, she was also the ship's navigator, much to the surprise of some of the other characters. It was also kind of cute that she had a crush on the protagonist, but she could never express her feelings, which often made her fluster. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I won't kick your ass. Another companion that I would like to mention is Jafar, the thieving gnome. This particular gnome learned how to speak English from pirates, so his language was uh, colorful to say the least. There's something funny in being called a clever or generous fucker. I had a lot of laughs talking to him, and he certainly made a lasting impression. Fuck yes. Well, why didn't you say so? You want it, it's yours. You give to Chaffa? Matter wise and generous fucker! <laughs> of course. That's me. You're no longer my pivy, Jafar. From now on, you are an adult gnome and you can call yourself Matar. Yippee! Guane Topola Famosa! Big joy! Glad you're happy about it. We go to Jaffa's island now? Not so fast. Things to do first, remember? Soon then? Soon! You Jaffa's best friend, homie! One wise and brave fucker! <laughs> Second of all, even though I'm not necessarily a pirate enthusiast, Another one of the big strengths of Risen 2 is the whole pirate theme, which I thought was pretty well done. With the exception of ship battles, it has just about everything else. 
drinking, shooting and fighting competitions, the various dirty tricks you could use in combat, such as throwing sand, salt or coconuts in the face, or owning your own parrot and monkey. Becoming a pirate captain with your own ship and crew, hunting for treasure or fighting other pirate captains. It's all there and therein lies the charm of the game. If nothing else, I can argue for it being a fun, pirate themed game. Third of all, I like the world design. The lush jungles that were sometimes easy to get lost in and the waterfalls that sometimes had secret caves behind them. One waterfall in particular had a gate that required a password to open and one of the options was Tetrion Dock, which was the password to the water mages in the new camp in Gothic 1. Let's see... <laughs> Tetrion Dock! <laughs> wow, Tetrion Dock! <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not supposed to know this. I I um, heard it in a, a dream. That's why. That's where I heard Tetrian Doc in a dream. Tetrian Doc. Hmm. <laughs> this might take some time. No, I don't think so. Open. Nope, not that. Password. Well, worth a try. Stop. Nobody may pass without the password. And the password is. Tetriandach. The password is Tetriandach. That's right. You may pass. That was a nice touch that gave me a good nostalgia kick. I also like the native temple design and exploring them to go look for treasure. Using monkeys instead of the Nautilus spell like in Risen was pretty creative. These monkeys were not only useful but also very cute. You could use them to get into various places in the world, leading to treasure or even alternative ways to complete quests. And speaking of alternative ways to complete quests, using voodoo magic to take control of other influential characters and make them do my bidding for my own gain, led to some of the most hilarious and memorable moments in the game and I would say a major highlight. Humor is where this game shines at and Voodoo is at the top of the list for reasons why. The design of the settlements and camps throughout the world was also well done and memorable. Antigua, the so-called Pirates Den, was my favorite. In fact, this whole island was one of the best places to explore in the entire game and had some of the more interesting quests and characters. Lastly, I like the new design of the character sheet. Here you could use glory to increase your attributes, which would lead to an increase in their governing skills. Calling experience glory was a pretty nice touch. The fact that there were no level ups, instead you could spend glory whenever you wanted, allowed for flexibility when building my character. To increase these skills, you had to pay various trainers throughout the world on the one hand, but on the other hand, you could also drink permanent stat boosting potions and use different pieces of equipment depending on the situation. Moreover, sometimes you would find clues about certain artifacts which would also increase your attributes and skills. It was very useful to be able to see what skills you are missing and their requirements that could still be learned from trainers. At its heights, I like this game. If I were to think only about its good parts, then I would fondly remember the charm and the humor and it would put a smile on my face. Unfortunately, it annoyed me at everything else and by the end I was just happy to have finished it and moved on. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if you would give me your attention, now I would like to roast Risen 2 for the rest of this review. Let's begin with none other than the story. Following the events on the island of Oranga, where you defeated a fire titan and saved the island from guaranteed destruction and therefore saving everybody else on the island as well, you now find yourself in this miserable manhole at the bottom of a rum bottle, having forgotten absolutely every single useful skill that you have ever learned, including how to wipe your own arse. As to how you went from this 
To this, the game does not say. Doing some digging, I found out because magic was banned and because you've made use of magical items, you are now distrusted. Combined with the fact that humanity is losing the battle against titans, the protagonist became depressed. But why was magic banned, you ask? Allegedly, it was deemed too dangerous, but the game doesn't explain any of that. Not even basic things such as, how was it banned? By use of anti-magic or banned by law? Because if magic was banned by law, then why would you care about it once you've become a pirate? Or why does Elder care as a druid who answers to nobody? Who banned magic? Is magic completely gone from the world? No explanations whatsoever. Here's another question. What happened with your Titan Lord armor? No answers. Reason 2 acts as if you should just forget about the past, just like the protagonist has forgotten every single skill that he has learned in Risen. Could excessive drinking give one selective amnesia? Well, so it would seem. Why is it so difficult for Piranha Mice to make a proper follow-up story when the same protagonist is involved? When we look back at some of the older games, at least in Gothic 2, there was some sort of explanation as to why you've lost your skills, armor and sword. Zardas explains that in order to save you from the Temple of the Sleeper, he had to use the power of your sword and armor to teleport you out of there, which made you very weak as well. So there we go, a fantasy explanation that could make you suspend disbelief. At the end of Gothic 2, you leave the island of Corinus on the Esmeralda to go to the mainland. In Gothic 3, the same thing happens as in Risen 2. No explanation as to why you've lost your gear or your skills entirely, which is complete rubbish. Fortunately for Gothic 3, there is a content mod which allows you to select your choices from Gothic 2 during the installation and then gives you some of these basic skills and armor based on your choices. For instance, if you've learned alchemy from Constantino and Carinus, then in Gothic 3 you get the skill to make basic potions at the start of the game. You could also find your old armor and weapons somewhere scattered throughout the world, and finding these was one of the best moments I've experienced in the entire Gothic trilogy and in gaming in general. It showed that my choices mattered, that it was my story and it had continued. My thrill and excitement were indescribable from seemingly such a small detail. But small details matter. Even though Gothic 3's expansion for Second Gods wasn't developed by Piranha Bytes, the same thing happens again. You start from scratch on the same bloody character. Seriously now, how many times can one guy forget everything he knows? It's pretty ridiculous. Say what you want about Gothic 4 Arcania, that it's not a good game, that it's not part of the canon, but you know one good thing that Arcania did? In its expansion, it allowed you to import your character and to keep playing for where you left off in the main game. Finding new gear and learning new skills. So here comes Risen 2, Clean Slate. You start from scratch with no follow-up from Risen as if nothing happened. The first trainer you meet in the game teaches you how to sneak for 500 gold by telling you to bend your knees. I think it was supposed to be funny, but it was sad, uncreative and annoying just like most of the things in this game. How about instead of this, we started with sneak already learned and from there we could learn some new abilities for a change. Here are some examples. When you sneak, you can now eavesdrop on people to learn secrets leading to treasure or alternative ways to complete quests. Or how about when sneaking, you can now attack enemies for bonus damage and stun, giving you an opening in combat. Or perhaps when you sneak, you can now roll, Skyrim style so you can get around easier in those large warehouses and other places. It's not so hard to come up with something creative, but bend your knees for 500 gold, come on. Imagine if you could start Risen 2 with an interactive flashback with the events from Risen where you can go and select your choices you've made in your playthrough, 
and based on those choices you would perhaps get some small mementos to let you know that this is your story and your choices matter. This flashback should also explain what happened between the games and what brought you to this situation. The protagonist is the very definition of a hero after saving an entire island worth of people, not to mention all the help he has given to the people of Faranga. By all means, he should be respected and revered, not shunned, disrespected and treated with suspicion. It reminds me of Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, where he hides depressed on this planet, drinking space cow milk after saving the entire galaxy. That's the hero at the beginning of Risen 2, in his dungeon hole drinking rum, being a waste of a human being, waiting for someone to come and rescue him. It's pathetic and unbecoming of a hero. In the first hour of gameplay, you find out what the story is all about. Patty wants to find her father's treasure, a quest that was started back in Risen, and we also have a water titan problem with Mara sinking ships, so logically she must be stopped. You team up with Steelbeard, who tells you that you need 4 artifacts to defeat her. And that's it, that's the story. It's as straightforward and simple as it sounds, not to mention that it's so predictable, there's no need to further explain it. There's nothing more or deep here. You find your 4 artifacts, you go to Mara and you kill her. You might think that looking for these artifacts makes for some interesting story points, but that's not the case. Let me show you one of them. You team up with Pirate Captain Slane, who is in possession of one of the artifacts. Before you even meet the man, you hear about him in town that he's a treacherous madman. After you meet him, he suggests that you go on an island where he stashed the artifact, but wait, you must go alone, just you and him. On this island, he leads you to a cave and tells you to go look inside while he awaits at the entrance. The treasure is in the chest at the end of this cave. Anybody older than a toddler should be able to tell that this is a trap, so I did the only sensible thing and beat his scheming ass down and went inside the cave to get the artifact. Lo and behold everyone, there he is, back up, standing at the entrance to spring his trap. This story has some scooby doo level of writing, which is frankly a waste of time. But wait, the best part is when you catch up to him, he tells you that the reason he betrayed you is because he's in love with Mara, everybody. Yes, Mara, just look at what we're talking about. I don't even know. And no, the other quests in the game aren't any better. One of the most important characters in the game is Captain Gregorius Emmanuel Steelbeard. A character who had so much build up, starting from Risen and all throughout Risen 2. This guy was hyped up to be such a legend, the greatest pirate captain to have ever sailed on the southern seas. He was feared and respected by everybody. Even his enemies feared and respected him. The man knew no equal, except that he died like an idiot by charging at Mara, sword in hand, even though he knew full well that she couldn't be defeated without the four artifacts, since it was his own bloody plan. Again, it was supposed to be funny, but I just stood there like stupid, not understanding if this joke is supposed to have a punchline. Well, it does. You as the protagonist will be constantly reminded throughout the rest of the game that you must fill in Steelbeat's shoes as his successor. People will remind you all the time of the legend that Steelbeard was and how he had no equal. <sighs> no equal in stupidity, no doubt. When you meet Steelbeard for the first time, Patty asks him that you both join his crew so you can go fight Mara. Steelbeard says that you can only join if you can prove your worth as a pirate. And therein lies the problem that I've pointed out earlier. No follow-up from the events of Risen. 
When you tell him that you have defeated a fire titan on the island of Faranga and implicitly save his daughter from guaranteed death, he shrugs it off and tells you to go do some menial tasks for him, like killing some crabs on the beach or supplying the ship with water and rum. What annoys me is that the game is chock full of menial tasks and fetch quests. It reminds me of Gothic 3 Forsaken Gods where you as this godlike being descend from the heavens to do menial tasks for these characters who can't find their own arse without help. When the job description involves killing titans, the sole guy who has ever killed one and lived to tell about it should be the no-brainer choice. But no, first go get me 10 pig's asses and then I'll give you the opportunity to become a cursed pirate, join a pirate war, get treated like a dog, scrub the ship decks and not get paid for any of that. Sure, that sounds like a great deal. Where do I sign up? And as a side note, note that becoming a cursed pirate doesn't mean a thing. Allegedly, Mara is supposed to send her minions after you, the sunken ones, but you simply find them throughout the world just like any other monster, so who cares? They could have been plushy unicorns or crabs, it doesn't make any difference. So after you join up with Steelbeard, you go to the Sword Coast to look for the Titan Harpoon one of the artifacts necessary to kill Mara. Here you spend a little time with Steelbeard, and I emphasize a little, where he escorts you a bit around the jungle and you find out that he's afraid of caves. Quality time with O Captain, my captain. The problem is that during the short and insignificant amount of time you spend with Steelbeard, you're supposed to create an emotional rapport with the man, so that later on, when he dies, you're sad about it and you should feel like carrying on his torch. But I didn't feel that way in the slightest. In the short time that I've spent with him, I disliked him and disrespected him at every chance I got. And Patty did too. To me, he looked like a mad old fart to quote Patty, who could barely keep it together, not somebody worthy of being called a legend. It frustrated me to no end to be compared to Steelbeard throughout the game in view of the fact that I was taking down titans and performing heroics while Steelbeard's only observable feat was to charge at Mara for no reason and die. I was not sad when Steelbeard died, I was glad because he was annoying. What I was sad about was that he haunted me for the rest of the story because the game assumed that I should have liked them. Well, I didn't. Not once did I hear a story about Steelbeard's heroics or his adventures or what made him so famous. But just know that he was and care about it. Three words. Poorly written character. So moving on with this already glorious story, here on the Sword Coast you finally get to make a decision whether to help the Shaganumbi Voodoo tribe or the Inquisition for their muskets. Note that you don't join them in the sense that you join a faction in any of the previous games in the series, but instead you simply choose between two different playstyles, sort of, either Voodoo or muskets. For me, it wasn't really that much of a choice at all. On the one hand, the Shaganumbi were very funny people, on the other hand, the Inquisition were racist, sexist and slavers, and not by my description, but theirs. As a human being with empathy for other human beings, and the fact that musket play is very straightforward and boring, I don't ever see myself replaying this game to side with the Inquisition. And this is one of the major gripes I have with Risen 2. What is one of the most important aspects that makes a great RPG? Thinking back, all of the best RPGs I have ever played were the ones that I have replayed numerous times over the years, including the ones in the Gothic Trilogy and Risen 1. The thing that usually makes me want to replay them is to try a different class from the last time. The question I pose myself is, does Risen 2 have any replayability elements that would bring me back? 
The clear answer is no. Even if I haven't joined the Inquisition to get the muskets, I could still find shotguns throughout the world and with the stat boosting potions that Voodoo has to offer, I could do a pseudo range combat as well if that was even remotely interesting. Because you see, the gameplay just boils down to shoot and roll away with some aiming involved. Suffice to say that I would much rather have range combat like in Gothic 3 where you had to calculate for the trajectory of the arrow and spend time drawing the bow. Where in Gothic 3 I would have to plan ahead, use the high ground or different tactics which made it more difficult and interesting. In Risen 2's roll and shoot away style, I would just get bored. Another difference between helping the Inquisition instead of the natives is enrolling the companion Venturo instead of Charney. Well, Venturo is very powerful indeed, probably the most powerful companion because he's using a musket, which does deal very high amount of damage. Compared to Venturo, Chani is terrible at combat, she does almost no damage, but she can heal you once you're below 50% HP. However, she's quite unreliable and unless you're out of healing items, you're better off healing yourself. So from a pure combat perspective, Venturo is a better fighter, but he's also a much more boring character when compared to Chani. Ultimately, I will still take Patty on my adventures, so it doesn't matter that much. Apart from these two factors, a few quests and conversations might be a little bit different based on your faction choice, but ultimately the whole game plays the same. So no, I don't see any reason to replay Risen 2. Let me give you an alternative version of a game that I would like to replay. Instead of you becoming a pirate by force and then having this pointless choice between Voodoo and Muskets, imagine starting classless like usual and then having a choice between joining one of the three factions, the Inquisition, the Pirates and the Natives. The Inquisition is similar to the Militia and Paladins in Gothic 2 and the Inquisition in Risen 1. They're militaristic, stickler for rules, respect authority and have a goal of maintaining peace fighting evil and protecting the weak. The pirates are opportunistic, always look to trick you and to profit off of you, have no respect for authority, only for feats of strength, glory and intimidation. Their way is the way of the dirty tricks, drinking and looking for treasure, similar to the mercenaries in Gothic 2 or the bandits in Risen 1. Finally, the voodoo natives, similar to the mages in Gothic 2 and Risen 1, they use voodoo magic, pray to their gods, are part of a close-knit group and their lore should be expanded. All these factions come with their own gear, unique abilities, storyline and lore. So this already looks like a much more interesting gameplay experience, one that I would come back to just to see what the other factions have to offer. Most importantly, it would feel like a choice, something that I consider to be highly valuable in RPGs. In contrast to being forced to become a pirate under the leadership of this weakly written Steelbeard, then given this crappy choice between the Inquisition and the natives with no further implications and the rest of the game playing exactly the same, it's pretty clear why this doesn't work. To make matters even worse, the story ends in the very predictable way of you fighting the bad titan lord Mara, which for me was a 10 second fight. We'll talk about Voodoo later, but cursing her made her completely inert, which led to a very short and effortless fight. The dialogue throughout the game made Mara seem like such a force to be reckoned with, but she kept showing up every now and then and instead of just killing me like she did with Steelbeard, she was teleporting in and out of my face. But why? What was the point? Was it meant to be funny again? When I was fighting Garcia, she teleported right inside the fire temple which was pretty far away from the sea. No idea how, she threatened Garcia, 
and then teleported back out. Why didn't she just kill me then? I didn't have all the artifacts at that point, so she had absolutely nothing to worry about. Completely garbage written boss. Mara was as threatening in this game as a meat bug. In fact, every time she showed up, I kept thinking about Rama, the margarine. Maybe it was because of her white face and not being threatening at all. Who knows? Sure, maybe Risen 1 didn't have the most elaborate plot or villain either, but at least it was consistent in its execution and it kept the mystery and interest up until the end. A simple and well-delivered plot. It is complete overkill to compare it to something like Gothic 2, but the level of writing is like throwing a chicken against a mountain troll. Gothic 2's boss fight was foreshadowed from the very beginning of the game. Zardas tells you about it. As you progress through the game, you start to unravel the puzzle piece by piece. By fighting enemies, doing quests, exploring, you find out more about the root of all evil. The boss's henchmen were the dragons, and you know how intimidating and difficult they were to beat. And then came the seekers, those creeps who would give you nightmares literally, and were bloody everywhere and quite strong as well. Up until the final boss room, you never see the boss, but you slowly start to put the puzzle together. And all that preparation up until the fight was worthwhile, because it was not easy to take him down. The game difficulty also kept up with you. The stronger you got, the more and tougher enemies the game would throw at you. It's not even remotely funny. What a big difference between a good game with good writing and this mess is. Rama's henchmen were pirate captains, who were complete pushovers and brainwashed lunatics, whom I've one-shot. The game might have been funny here and there, but by the end of it, I was not amused. I was disappointed. Rama was the worst boss I have seen in the series so far, and Gothic 3 didn't even have a boss fight. This fight could have easily had multiple phases, with each new phase Rama becoming more and more powerful, with diverse attacks and attack patterns. But that would have taken some given a damn. This game doesn't do any of that. Instead, it just feels cheap and hastily done. Let's get this over with type of deal. So if the story sucks and there's nothing more to it, then the question is, is the gameplay any good? Because after all, it is possible to have a game with crappy story, but good enough gameplay that is enjoyable to replay. Gothic 3 comes to mind in this regard. Gothic 3's story didn't blow my mind, but the exploration, the combat, and the core gameplay loop were good enough to warrant many replays over the years. Let's start with the best worst part about this game, the combat. No, you thought the story was the worst part? Psh, the only thing that could match this garbage story is even more garbage combat, and that is saying something. The one thing that I didn't like about Risen's combat is now back on steroids, double tapping directional keys to roll. Oh my god, if I never have to play another game with this type of control scheme, it will be too soon. What is the problem with this? The problem is that it's extremely difficult to control your character in combat the way you want to. This game seems to use some kind of sluggish action queuing system, so if you're spamming your directional keys to roll away, which you would, then the combat will execute one additional action beside the current one. Which means that 99% of the time, when I try to roll away to dodge an attack, it will actually roll twice. That means it puts me out of position, so it negates any advantage that I could have had because of doing this. Ergo, it's not working. Here you might wonder, but why don't you simply double tap once, so you roll only once? Excellent question. Because the combat is sluggish and unresponsive, and if you're in the middle of an animation, like attacking, then the animation has to finish first before any other animation will occur, which means 
if you've made the mistake of spamming left click, it will queue up attack animations. So if you want to stop attacking, the game will execute one more attack animation, which you can't stop. So logically, you spam the directional keys to move the hell away, which most often leads to you getting hit because you attack more than you wanted, then roll away twice, which puts you out of position to flank and press your advantage. I don't know if I'm explaining this well enough to make it sound like garbage, but that's exactly what it plays like. Imagine if instead your roll and block animations would simply cancel the attack animation. Moreover, the roll is now activated with shift plus directional keys. So if you were in the middle of an attack, but the enemy just started his own attack animation, you could quickly cancel by rolling with shift, which would put you on the flank of your enemy, allowing you to press your advantage. Simple and effective. The next one is the target lock-on. This is the stuff of nightmares. Check this out. This is done by holding the right click, which is also the blocking animation. You have to get pretty close to your target to lock onto it, and you can only tell that you've locked on because your character will start following your target, but with no other indicators. The lock-on distance is the same as the distance at which an enemy's name would show up, which is pretty close to being melee distance. If you want to use ranged attacks such as scepters or offhand range attacks like pistols or throwing knives, you basically have to be so close that any melee enemy could simply lounge at you, attack you and interrupt you. If you don't lock on, you'll most likely shoot your pistol in the opposite direction, which has happened to me more times than I can count. Sometimes, because the shooting animation is so damn slow, I would just let go of block too soon as I'm moving in the opposite direction to avoid damage, which would again result in me shooting the air. Imagine if instead you had a toggable target lock by pressing the middle mouse button or something else, which would direct the camera at the enemy, so whenever you'd press E to shoot your pistol, the character would automatically turn to the enemy and shoot him. The ridiculous part is that you can actually keep the target lock as you move away from the target, even so far away that the model fades away and you can still use abilities on the target. So instead of having actual range targeting, where you could use scepters from a distance, you have to be in the face of the enemy and start using these long-winded animations while the enemy can and will simply just attack you. But it doesn't stop there. With some exceptions, the enemies have no discernible attack patterns and will simply attack you relentlessly until you're dead. Because there is no stamina system for either you or the enemies, good luck finding an opening in their defenses. In Risen, the enemies had some well-defined attack patterns so you could learn them and know when to counterattack. They also had some unpredictability, but for the most part you could get a sense for it and block in time. In Risen 2, even against the enemies who do have some sort of attack patterns, you'll probably still be sabotaged by the action queue system where you either attack or roll more than you wanted to. And when you combine it with the fact that the enemies can attack you relentlessly and unpredictably as well with no stamina system, it makes the combat feel like a hot mess. Also please note that rolling away doesn't make you invincible, so if you roll away while the enemy is launching an attack at you, you will still take the damage. Fighting humanoids like pirates is a complete RNG fest and winning against them feels unsatisfying. Blocking doesn't work 100% of the time anyway. Enemies can still go through your block, especially if you move while blocking, which really happens all the time. So yeah, I had to figure out a way to cheese this combat altogether. The way to do that is to roll back twice and do a heavy attack. If you time it correctly, no enemy has a counter for this and is perfectly safe. Heavy Attacks is a skill that you can learn with at least 2 points into Blades, which is very cheap and it changes everything. 
With light attacks, it's like you're not doing anything. To the enemy, you're just sitting there doing nothing. Heavy attacks actually stagger your enemies, so you can chain them back to back. But this isn't fail proof either, so the best way is to cheese them by rolling back twice and performing a heavy attack. Rinse and repeat. Do note that there is no explanation in game for how to use new skills like kick, so I had to google it to find out. Which is right click plus spacebar by the way, very intuitive, said no one ever. The range combat felt just as clunky to play but also boring and straightforward. It boils down to shoot and roll away. There's no damn reloading animation for your muskets, which is why it feels so overpowered as well. When you combine it with the fact that you can pause the game in your inventory, it's like a cheat galore. No other Risen or Gothic game had a pause in the inventory, which meant that you had to prepare ahead of time. But no, in Risen 2, you can open your inventory, go take a shower, make a sandwich, all in the middle of combat, so what's the problem? Then you rely on muskets to shoot and roll away with no animation, and boom, hard difficulty made easy. Excuse me while I uninstall this game and go play Gothic 3 where you actually had to do something to make the ranged combat work, or any other game in the series previous to this one. Because this felt so disgustingly half-assed, it's not even funny. No reloading animations, no eating animations, pause menus, I can't take this seriously. Was this also meant to be a joke? When you compare ranged combat with voodoo scepters, it's clear why muskets are considered to be overpowered. To cast scepter magic and fear an enemy, you need to have it targeted, which means you need to be close to it where the enemy can simply attack you and interrupt you. Why does scepter magic have such long animations? What idiot would just stand there and do a dance chant while some scary monster is looking to hack you into pieces? Why not allow Voodoo to be cast while on the move, at very least? Of course that Voodoo doesn't seem appealing in Risen 2, he has three different extremes. One is the underwhelming scepter magic, which feels clunky and only situationally useful. One is the overpowered cursed doll magic, which renders all enemies, all bosses and Rama completely useless and one-shottable. And the last one is the humor from possessing story characters. It's such a mixed bag. When you add this to the already clunky and unresponsive combat, all of these long-winded animations that you have to cast in the face of your enemies, the combat is an absolute nightmare, it doesn't feel good to play. Forget about the story being bad, you won't even get past the combat in this game because of how garbage it is. Okay, let's talk about the other aspect which constitutes gameplay to me and that is exploration. Sadly, this is also a mixed bag. Sure, on the one hand, I like going around exploring temples and digging for pirate treasure. It felt very pirate-like and in theme with this game. Because I also liked the world design, it was nice going around and admiring the views. So what was the problem? The problem was that all of that was greatly overshadowed by the garbage chests I kept finding randomly scattered around the world. These damned 5 gold and 1 provision pointless chests that had absolutely no reason to exist. Why were they out there? Completely at random, like I was playing some damn arcade game which had to reward me with tiny BT rewards every 10 steps I took. From a role-playing perspective, who would bring these chests in the middle of nowhere to put 5 gold and 1 provision in them? There were also other chests which had 10 gold and 2 provisions, or some variation of that. But what was the point? Was this also supposed to be funny? Subvert my expectations or what? I hated taking the time to go off the beaten path just to find these nonsensical chests lying around. What's even worse is that even the log chests felt unrewarding. Some chests with high lockpicking skill requirements like 90 out of 90 had worse rewards than some of the 30 out of 90 chests. It made no damn sense. 
Overall, I feel like lockpicking was a complete and total waste of my time. I made gold in this game, but not by doing exploration, with the exception of treasures, which are kind of their own thing, but by crafting and selling items. I get it, not all paths lead to treasure or should lead to treasure, but in Risen 2, most paths don't lead to treasure. In fact, you might as well just rush through the game since Rama is a one-shotable boss anyway, so who cares? You can have two trucks of these dog shit provisions, it won't make a difference in the end. By the end of the game, I had completely given up on exploration because it was a bloody waste of time. I never thought I would get to dislike exploration in a Piranha Bytes game, but here we are. One of the most confusing aspects of these chests giving 5 gold and 1 provision is the fact that when you think about how much learning new skills cost, it makes no damn sense. All the skill prices come in increments of 500, so only the most basic skills will cost 500, but the rest will cost 1000, 1500 and 2000 gold. Why is there such a streamlined inflation of prices? Which is even more eerie because all of the trainers in the world ask for the same amount of gold. You need to open hundreds of these 5 gold chests to learn even the most basic skills. It's insane! Why does a guy ask for 500 gold to teach you sneaking from inside a prison cell? Where is he going to keep all that gold? Well, since we have unlimited inventories, we might as well just make the most out of it, forget about immersion. Looking back to Risen, there was very little gold to be had there. 500 gold was already a very sizable amount that could teach you a whole bunch of skills. All the skills, items and other gold requirements were quite varied across the board, which made it feel organic and immersive. The exploration and opening chests felt rewarding and well thought out, and pickpocketing was much, much cooler, where you could choose one item from a selection which made sense for that particular character to have on him. But that's because Risen valued immersion as one of its core features. What also contributed to my dislike of exploration in Risen 2 was the fact that it was far, far too easy. And the reason for that is because the companions were overpowered and invincible. Yes, I loved Patty's character, but her companion AI was too damn strong. In any other game, you started off weak and probably had to run away from most things. Creatures like wolves, minecrawlers, skeletons and zombies, they were mid to late game and you wouldn't stand a chance against them at the beginning. But no. In Risen 2, you start off with Patty and she can kill every single creature with no difficulty. If she goes down, she comes back up after a short while fully healed. In fact, you never have to worry about Patty's health or give her healing items. She is always fine. Everybody is always fine. Nobody will ever die in this game. Well, even Steelbeer needed a cutscene to die because the plot demanded it. So I didn't have a slither of worry, half the game I simply hid behind Patty's skirt and let her do the fighting, because she can. In Risen, I had to be mindful of Freddy, always heal him with spells and scrolls. Freddy could die on me in the middle of combat, so I had to make sure to reserve enough mana to either resummon him, or heal him, or run away if I couldn't. I would judge combat differently. And even so, Summon Skeleton was a magic spell only available midway through the game, I certainly didn't start with it. Just like in the Gothic series, the start of Risen was pretty brutal, I had to run away more than I could fight. This kept some mystery over the world. The irony is, even though the companions were overpowered in Risen 2, they were also very poorly coded. I can't tell you how many times the companion AI would just stand there and stare at the enemy without doing a damn thing. Huh. 
Just hit him. Ja whoa, 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 whoa. Just bloody hit him, Eldrick. Oh, for the love of... Just hit him. Just hit him. You know what? Fuck this. Unbelievable. At the beginning, I thought that I could sandwich the enemies, you know, MMORPG style, where the tank turns the boss with his back to the group, but in this game it turned out to be a big mistake. That made the companion AI extremely confused and unresponsive. So the best way to fight was to hide behind the companions and wait for the monsters to approach them, hence hide behind Patty's skirt. Alright, so if the gameplay sucks, what else do we have? Well, we have copy-pasted assets everywhere. I dare you to tell me if you know what ship I'm on at the moment. You probably can't tell because they all look the bloody same, identical, characters with the same faces, numerous. This guy is Jimmy, but Jimmy who? Jimmy the lighthouse keeper, or this Jimmy, or that Jimmy? Who knows, they're all Jimmy. They've all been assimilated and are now part of the collective. Low effort. There was a distinct lack of attention to details in Risen 2. Like for that one quest in Caldera where you have to figure out a way to get inside Garcia's room on the second floor of the inn. You can't get the key to his room because you already have your own room at the inn. So what do you do? I had no idea up until almost at the end of the game where I accidentally came across a guy whom I could give my key to so the innkeeper would give me Garcia's key instead. Would it have been so difficult just to have a monologue single line where my character says, hmm, I wonder if I can give my key to someone else. Boom, I would have known to look for someone. Another example is Patty's treasure hunt quest. We have to go look for her father's treasure who was supposed to have written some clues on how to find it. We reach a place with four graves. Three are a deadly trap, one is the treasure. How do you know which one is which? Well, you can't. If you only speak English, you will never figure this one out. The clue relies on the names on the graves. Sogbart translates to Kostbart in German, which means precious, which is mentioned in one of the clues. One chest is precious, the others are deadly. I could have spent an eternity trying to figure this one out without googling it. Would it have been so difficult to have an anagram of precious written on the grave instead? Or perhaps a different hint in the clue? What's even more annoying about this quest is that it's Patty's main quest. This was the reason why we went on this bloody adventure to begin with. She wanted to find her father's treasure. So naturally you'd expect her to help you out more. Like for instance, when you tell her that you don't understand the clues, for good reason, she just gives you a snarky comment telling you to dig up and use your brain for once. What the actual duck? Why does everybody just sit with their thumbs up their butts in Risen 2 and just wait for you to do everything? It's pathetic! This quest concludes with even more exposition about bloody Steelbeard. He's been dead since the beginning of the game because of his own stupidity. We are close to the end of the game and we still get to learn more about him. Come on! At this point in the game I was outright frustrated. I was tired of this, it's such a low effort. Here's one more example, just to drive it home. You visit the Marakai native tribe. The chieftain of the tribe is old and is looking to hold a competition between two warriors to determine which one is more suited to take over as chieftain. So what do you have to do? You have to convince either one of the warriors to work for them and then you get to complete three tasks in their place, which involves hunting, fighting and answering some riddles. And then it is decided that the guy you worked for is fit to rule the tribe. So you do everything for him and that shows his strength? There is a complete and distinct lack of creativity put into these quests. 
That's the level of writing in Risen 2. For the rest of the quests in the game, all you have to look forward to are fetch quests, kill quests and escort quests. Kill me 10 of this, bring me 5 pigs asses, etc. Even when you think that a quest might lead to some interesting development, like for instance, when bringing trophies to the Commandant's daughter in Puerto Isabella, it only ends up being a fetch quest and nothing more. I came back later to check to see if she did something with her with the trophies, if she created something with them, if something had changed, but nothing, nothing at all, just a fetch quest for a little bit of gold and glory. Ultra low effort. At the end of the day, when I drew the line, this game was nothing more than insipid mediocrity. Yes, it has some charm and humor, but not nearly enough to carry the train wreck that constitutes the story and the distinct lack of choices that affect the story. The poorly written characters like Steelbeard, the gameplay, the overused assets, and yes, even the music was bland and boring, mostly copyrighted, so no good original soundtrack like in Risen or the Gothic Trilogy. The game wanted to do something different and it did. It had some funny moments, but for the rest, I would have preferred to use my time to play something different. Risen 2 frustrated and annoyed me with its low effort and uncreative choices more than it made me laugh. I don't find any replay value in this game. There are no different classes or factions to join. Choosing between a morally questionable inquisition for muskets or natives for voodoo is hardly a choice when you could simply use ranged weapons as a voodoo magician and even then for nothing more than a repetitive roll and shoot type of gameplay. This game offered very little challenge with an extremely disappointing boss fight and ending. Why go through all the trouble when Rama is nothing more than a pushover? As a fan of the series, I wanted to see what happens next after Risen, but after having played Risen 2, I am sorely disappointed. If I ever miss some of the humor, I'll just rewatch the fun moments in my Let's Play videos. But as it stands, this will not be a game that I will ever replay in the future. This was my review for Risen 2. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video and have a great day.